Hi everyone, I'm Snehal Pradhan, former India cricketer, online cricket coach and broadcaster, commentator, cricket writer. Uh, you are watching my channel Cricket with Snehal. No, this is not Cricket with Snehal. This is my other channel, Snehal Pradhan Projects. Uh, but you are watching this interview series, hashtag I learned a lot in an interview with Hadil Obed. Hadil Obed is the CEO of Khelo Cricket, a platform in Pakistan which connects grassroots hardball cricketers and facilitates tournaments and provides various services to them. She's also one of the uh, co-owners of Pakistan's only female-run textile company which she runs entirely with her sisters. Uh, I've been following her on social media for a few years. She's also written a few articles for Crick Info in the past and I found uh, her to be a fascinating character and I thought let's bring her on for a chat, learn a little bit more about her, her life, her double life essentially because she's uh, she's running two path-breaking professions. So I hope you guys enjoy this conversation with Hadi Lobed. Um, so, so there were so many things that, you know, uh, I wanted to chat with you about and so many reasons why I wanted to chat with you. Um, one, I mean, the main thing for me is I've loved seeing your work, whatever you've been uh, sharing on social media, the work of Kalo Cricket, um, not just for from the women's cricket point of view, which is what really interested me, but also from the fact that you're making such a big mark in the uh, grassroots cricket ecosystem in Pakistan. Um, and it, it very much comes across as if um, you are someone who I would normally imagine would not exist from the point <laughs> of view um, of from what I have heard of Pakistan, a few stories I've heard of Pakistan. I was doing a little bit of research on um, uh, an article on Sanamir um, maybe last year and um, a journalist in Pakistan told me that, you know, in Pakistan it's a big deal even if a woman sits with you know her feet across on a motorcycle rather than sitting with both feet on one side side saddle uh, mm. in in the context of that and in the context of the stories i hear of pakistan women's cricket team where you know even people who are currently in the cricket team have stories of not telling their neighbors that they are in the pakistan cricket team because of fear of you know what people will say in that kind of a context um, you are a i mean an entrepreneur in the cricket space um, a female entrepreneur in what is normally a male dominated field in terms of a cricket and b i, I assume business um, and entrepreneurship in pakistan um, just let's let's kind of uh, before we actually get into the present, can we go a bit, a bit into the past and tell me a little bit about your background and what has kind of led to the current uh, situation that you're in? Tell me a little bit about sure. it. Those kind so of firstly, things. thank you because that was a very, very kind sort of a synopsis that you made. I think you have overestimated uh, the impact, but I appreciate it. Um, so honestly, uh, it's not that I've ever played cricket. Uh, it's not that I've ever uh, even had sort of the opportunity growing up to play cricket because it wasn't really in the schools and universities and things. So um, my love for cricket came from watching cricket. And it came from absolutely, since I can't even remember, since I was probably six or seven, I was always obsessed with the sport. I like knew every single stat. I like wanted to like, you know, like, and at that point it was just the men's cricket team, you know, and, and there was so much love for it. And there still is so much love for it. I mean, I, I you know, I came back from college, I remember, and I started uh, writing on cricket and I wrote a number of articles for Cricket Info and Wisden and, and a bunch of, uh, you know, local newspapers, Dawn Tribune. And I kind of found that that was my outlet. That was my way of expressing my love for the sport. And, and every single article, I don't know whether you've read any of mine, but they all come from a perspective of being extremely emotional. Yeah. Um, and they're all like, you know, like straight from the heart, like super jizbati, like, you know, no holds barred, because that's how I always wrote. And that's how I always felt. And to date, I still feel like the biggest cricket fan. Like for me, mm. that comes from, you know. Um, and so, you know, my background was a little bit of just kind of loving cricket. And then I went into, I moved back from college and I started working for my family business, which is textiles. Mm. Um, and so uh, my four sisters and I, we run uh, Pakistan's only women run women owned textile company. So we so kind cool. of, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so we do that. And then, um, but it wasn't enough for me. I needed to find something that I couldn't let go of my love for cricket. So it kind of went from just writing about it to me wanting to sort of give back to a sport in a sense that had given me so much. 
And so that's kind of why I started Kelo Cricket in essence, because the idea was that you don't have to play cricket because you want to make the Pakistan cricket team. You can play mm. cricket for the love of cricket. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the times that part of the amateur and the local cricket circuit gets lost, you know, where people think that if you're not vying for a goal, it's not worth playing, mm. you know. And I saw the decline in leagues and I saw the decline in schools and universities and I saw the decline overall. And I felt like there needed to be like, whether it's corporate cricket heroes or whether it's amateurs or local or whatever level, under 13, under 19, it needed to be highlighted. Mm. So that's why I wanted to create a community and like a platform for those who play cricket for the love of cricket. And that's how Kalo Cricket kind of came about. Mm. Um, and while I was in the Kalo Cricket circuit, like I think we were about six months in or seven months in because we launched late 2015. So we launched around October, but we kind of properly launched in December. Mm. Um, we Six months later, we kind of stumbled into this whole like women's cricket arena. And I mm. honestly didn't really know how much of a gap there was between the women's cricket and the men's cricket and the kinds yeah. of opportunity. And that's kind of how we ended up stumbling into it and realizing how much there was a real love and a real kind of desperation and thirst for women's cricket that didn't exist before. Mm. Um, and it was slowly gaining momentum on a grassroots level. And so then Kalo Cricket kind of came in and tried to sort of take that momentum with us. So, so there's so many uh, fascinating uh, things in that conversation I want to pick up on. But before we actually get to the Kalo cricket, uh, you mentioned a couple of times you came back from college. Can you give me a little bit of an idea? Uh, you, sounds like you went away out of uh, Pakistan for college. I did. Where I did. did you go? And uh, the reason I'm asking this is because the passion you have for Pakistan and the country and, you know, that connection is yeah. very obvious. So I'm sure at some point there must have been a conversation, which is what we see in India also. I've got two brothers you know, studying abroad, working abroad, that, you know, why come back? Why come back to Pakistan when you can have an opportunity very often after education to make a better life, maybe in another country? So it was never a thought for me to mm -hmm. stay there. It was never, it was an, I could have if I really wanted to, but I never really wanted to. I felt like home was always Pakistan. Our family was here. Our life was here. Um, and the things I loved are here. Like I have such a strong affinity and I've always been wildly patriotic and as jaded as I might have been over the years, because it gets harder, the older you grow, the more you see the realities of what your country is, the good and the bad. Yeah. I've always been so, so, so patriotic about Pakistan that I never really considered having a life abroad. Like for me, whatever you want to make the opportunities, everything Pakistan was ripe for it. And it was it for me. So, you know, I studied in, um, I studied my entire schooling years, O levels, A levels in Pakistan. And then I went to uh, Smith College in the US. So it's an all women's college. Um, in the US, I went um, from 2008 to 2012. And then I graduated and I moved back in 2012 and delved right in. So I know that a lot of people go and I don't have anything against that, like go make the best life you can. But yes. because the opportunities were there for me to try and explore and do well here, I mean, home is home, right? You love the food, you love the culture. It's easy with the people. I mean, you, you, you know everything, it's harder abroad. Yeah, yeah. In so many ways, uh, you're right. And like then the second part that I wanted to pick up on, and I had no idea about this before. I had seen, you know, a couple of places where your LinkedIn and your social media where you said textile manufacturer and um, but a, a woman run, woman owned business in Pakistan must be rare. I mean, let's put the cricket aside. You're you're already yeah. kind of in charge of another business where you're probably in a male dominated field. Is it fair to say? Very much so. Uh, textiles is a male dominated field. Uh, I think it pre predominantly will always be. We are seeing tricklings of more and more women coming into work um, in the textile field, whether it's designers or merchandisers. We are seeing more women rise up the ranks in management for women um, as well in textiles. So that's great. But predominantly, yes, uh, people in key boards, management positions, all of that, they are predominantly male. And when we came in, um, so the way we did it was essentially we inherited my father's business. So um, my father passed away in 2010. 
And then us four sisters, we kind of took it over um, at that point. And at the point when we took it over, it was like, your business nahi chalegi. like it's not possible, you know, uh, because and in, I mean, it was it was just a lot of noise in the in the background and around us. And it was just people saying it's never been done. Mm. It's not possible, mm. um, you know, but it was great that we had a support system and it was great that we had kind of each other and we sort of made it happen in that realm. Um, and it still is a very, very male dominated. And, and we see it when we go to ex, uh, like textile fairs and we see it yeah. when we go to a lot of places and people will walk up to us and say, where are you guys from? Are you from Turkey? Are you from India? Where are you from? And we'll say, no, we're from Pakistan. And it takes them a minute to understand that okay there's like four women standing in the stall from pakistan so it is it's it's quite amusing also in a sense um and it's quite exhilarating as well to see that like our gender has thankfully not in any way inhibited us from kind of you know continuing and running and growing this business yeah i mean your family dinner time conversations must be fascinating <laughs> So my eldest sister, um, she she's the only one who did not join the family business and she's a documentary producer. So she's like a whole different uh, ball game. Yeah, totally. Very interesting family. So, um, <laughs> I, so then kind of let's have uh, a conversation. So it sounds like you're living two lives. You're living the life of Hadi Lubed as um, the one of the people running a textile uh, manufacturing industry and you're living a life as founder and CEO uh, of Kelo Cricket. So yes, yes. just tell me how these both of these coexist because I mean running one company sounds exhausting. Yeah, it's um, it's been a challenge. It's not something uh, that I think it's harder, obviously, when you're juggling two things. Mm. I don't think um, there are days when I'm like, how am I going to manage both? Or like, what can I do? Um, I have been able to create systems in Kalo, but it took us it took me like three, four years to be able to actually get people in positions where I don't have to necessarily be at the ground at all times. There can be somebody else who's sort of my second, um, but it's hard. Uh, and there are days when I'm like, oh, I wish I just ran one business like a normal person and just, you know, this is a, a little out of control. Yeah. Um, I think COVID was was very, very hard for Kalo. And so I think that was the time when I had the biggest existential crisis with it and thought to myself, like, what am I doing? What if this is not the only pandemic? What if ground stays shut? Because at that point, there was like a situation where it looked like there may not be sport for a long time. Yeah. Um, and for a company that relies on sponsorships, for a, co- for a company that relies on playing and getting people together, people couldn't leave their homes. And so there was this legitimate fear in me that like, am I wasting my time? Is there a future in this? You know, like in terms of um, just understanding the future of the world. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I do live a double life. And, uh, you know, even in my family, they always say that they're like this Hadil who's the cricket lover and then there's Hadil who's in the textile. So so it's 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 definitely a double life. And, and I try and do it in a way where, um, you know, that I, I ascertain certain hours are attributed to Kalo Cricket and then certain hours are attributed to my uh, textile company. And I try and kind of juggle both. Sounds like such a challenge, uh, but let's um, maybe set a little bit of a, a context for people who don't know a lot about Kilo Cricket. Can you just tell us what your main uh, product is, uh, essentially? Mm-hmm. And uh, like you mentioned, sponsorships, how uh, the business essentially makes money, um, so as to understand how things come together. So uh, Kalo Cricket is an online platform that works towards the development of cricket on a grassroots level. Um, so whether it's uh, playing for your amateur league, whether it's you want to be the next Shahid Afridi or the next Sana Amir, or whether it's somebody who wants to just play for their company, their school, their university, we have created a community for people to come, connect, and play. That's basically the idea. And our name also, we kept as simple as possible, Kalo yeah. Cricket. I mean, it doesn't get easier than that. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the second thing you asked? Uh, the second thing was, how does Kalo Cricket make money? Because from uh, the point of view of the uh, consumers, you're giving them yeah. a service. But is yeah. this something, is this, uh, a so- is it an app? Is it uh, a website? Uh, is it something that has a registration fee? Or do you uh, rely on sponsorships, like you said? So we have a number of different revenue streams. Uh, mm-hmm. So the way it works is uh, the first way is we um, 
register teams, teams that are on our platform, they pay a certain like fee, it's a very nominal fee. Um, and then through that, we keep their stats and, um, you know, write match reports and kind of highlight their players. The second thing is uh, people ask us to come in and do photography, video highlights, things like that for like tournaments and matches and things. So we provide that service and we end up paying for, I mean, they end up paying for our service. Yeah. Um, the third thing is that we set up tournaments. Um, we actually do tournaments, uh, whether it's for women's, whether it's for men's cricket, university cricket. So we'll do um, men's tournaments or women's tournaments. We'll organize them in their entirety. And then people wow. will pay a fees to either be a part of the tournament or then we will get sponsors to sponsor those tournaments. Mm -hmm. So the kids, the jerseys, everything. And then Halo Cricket makes a fee of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fourth way is um, that companies approach us and they ask us to help do their corporate tournaments. So they will just give Kalo Cricket like a contract and they'll say, you know, just set up a whole tournament for us and we'll go ahead and we'll set up a tournament for them. Um, and then obviously we like charge a fee for that. So that's kind of how Kalo Cricket makes money. It's like in a number of different ways. Nice. So interesting. These these other uh, aspects of Halo Cricket, I had no idea about. So I'm kind of glad I asked yeah. you that. And let me ask, I mean, uh, the bulk of your cricket is probably grassroots cricket, which I'm assuming in Pakistan is tape ball cricket. Whereas in India, it would mostly be tennis ball cricket. Or is it a lot of leather ball cricket, leather ball matches that happen uh, on it's your platform? Really so we do a mix of hardball and tape ball, but 90% of the cricket that is, uh, sorry, I'm just putting my laptop on charge. 90% of the cricket that is played and that we end up uh, covering is all um, hardball cricket. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's, we, yes, the, because we're not really looking to tap into street cricket because uh -huh. street cricket, you can't really, um, keep stats for street cricket. Because I'll tell you what happens. Somebody is playing a tape ball match and their mom calls and is saying, ke, sabzi utha ke ghar. and they sit on their motorcycles and they go home, right? And that's kind of what tape ball cricket is. It's very like ad hoc, you know, six boys, eight boys, 10 boys. So you can't really, you can't really quantify or you can't really keep stats for that. But for tape ball tournaments, yes, we ourselves do a tape ball tournament every Ramzan for men and as well as women. And it keeps growing every year. Um, and we, but a lot of the cricket that we cover, a lot of the tournaments we do is all hardball cricket. Nice. Okay. That's, that's, that's fascinating. So it's a much, uh, a much more organized level of cricket, which you're kind of providing this service to. Yeah. Superb. Um, so like you said, you discovered once you got into Kalo cricket, this huge gap that exists um, in opportunities for women to play and opportunities for men to play. Tell us, like, especially for me, who's like really interested in what's going on in the rest of the women's cricket world. I see the similar things in India, but I, I'd like to get a real sense of uh, what things are like in Pakistan. I mean, uh, not just in your city, which city are you in, by the way, but like all over the country, what you've seen. Um, okay, so I, I can just give you from my experience. So um, there are um, multiple tape ball tournaments that happen in Ramzan. Like Ramzan is like tape ball mania in like Pakistan. Like everybody loves it. Everybody starts post iftar or post taravi and then goes all the way to like uh, Sehri time. You know, that's just how it is here. Mm -hmm. And you will see every gully and every ground, it has some form of cricket being played, hardball, tape ball. But it's always men. Hmm. Um, it's never women. And so in 2016, we did the first women's cricket tape ball night Ramzan tournament. And it was like a big deal. Like mm -hmm. we, we just like randomly rolled the dice and did a four team tournament. Mm -hmm. um, and we had over 250 registrations in 24 hours and we didn't know what to do with those girls because you know i i didn't even i was scared that we won't even be able to get two teams together i never in a million years would have imagined that that was the level of thirst and and enthusiasm that would come with a women's cricket tournament and they were all like it's not possible jayengi, maghrib ke baad, raat ko, you know and returning at three o'clock in the morning and at 4 a.m and they're all playing all night. It's such an experience. It's such a community. And I, and I always say this, that men's cricket, um, 
is so limited in this thing that when you go to a men's cricket tournament or a match, it's usually, there's not really that many supporters. There's not really a sense of community. But when you go to a women's cricket match, it's like a festival. It is parents, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, cousins, people tuning in. You know, when we were when we were live streaming our women's tournaments, um, which we do, I mean, there's people like writing saying, I'm so excited. My cousin is playing. I'm looking, watching from Dubai. I'm watching from Africa. I'm watching from here. Everybody's like so excited. Uh, moms have like driven their daughters at like 10 o'clock at night and like waiting till the daughter's done at like three o'clock in the morning, take them back. Dads are like giving like pep talks are like super emotional. They're like, oh my God, like how is my daughter getting this opportunity to play it's it's such a wholesome experience going to a women's cricket match or organizing one that you realize that the impact of this tiny game has is far reaching beyond what you can imagine it's giving them an outlet it's giving them inspiration it's giving them something to look forward to and the fact that girls didn't have that opportunity or they were few and far between you could see it in the number of uh, tournaments that were being done on a grassroots level, even on a hardball level. You mm. could see the number of tournaments being done on a school level, on a university level. So many schools didn't have uh, women's cricket teams. And those that did found it really hard to get grounds to practice on because a mm. lot of those grounds were already booked out for the men's teams. And they didn't necessarily want the women's teams playing there. You know, one of the biggest challenges we've seen is that, you know, so many coaches and academies will come up to us and say, we don't have a, a lot of times at certain grounds to practice our cricket. You know, mm. that's why it's struggling. It's really hard for us to find a ground, you know, and when they do, it's like, oh my God, finally, we're able to do the thing that we need to do, you know? So there is, it's such a large gap in so many ways, number of tournaments, uh, financial opportunities, um, you know, just basic things like grounds and training facilities. You could see the stark difference between men's cricket and women's cricket. And that's kind of why Kalo wanted to, in whatever small capacity it could, you know, and we've not even scratched the surface, to be very honest, but in whatever small capacity we could, we wanted to be able to give back to the girls. You know, every one of our tournaments has prize money, significant prize money, you know, enough to be able to get them, you know, kits and things like that. You keep giving them prizes, keep giving them incentives to keep playing and give back to the academy so that they can invest in the girls. You know, right. that's kind of what, what our thought process has been. This is really, I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, not surprising uh, because, you know, there's an audience, 50% of the audience, which has kind of been ignored. Um, and on the other hand, super surprising because I'm sure, like you said, girls coming out to play in the middle of the night would have been, uh, there would have been some pushback. There would have been some sections of people who would say, no, this is not something that's supposed to happen. Have you like experienced that side of it as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, I got a lot of grief. Um, I got a lot of messages. I got a lot of hate on social media. Um, I got, and by social media, I mean like people messaging on Kalo's page. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I would be blocking people like by the second and like deleting. Like it was the first couple of times I did it, it was really, really heavy. I think the first tournament that I did was the ultimate like shocker because we were doing it in Ramzan. It was like, oh my God, you know, girls shouldn't be out playing cricket in any case. And then on top of that, you add a religious aspect to it. It was like, it was, it was a lot. Um, you know, we got, I got a lot of messages. I got a lot of, um, you know, we, we, in all our tournaments, we make sure there's security at the gate because we always uh -huh. want to like filter it. So yeah. random men can't come to watch. You have to be either, you have to be connected to a player. Right. Um, otherwise you can't just come otherwise it's just going to become like very rowdy and very unmanageable yeah. uh, but we got a lot of grief we got a lot of pushback a lot of um, sort of random religious sort of things thrown at us um, and you know I just kind of laughed and ignored it all and said okay let's see let them play if somebody stops us they'll stop us but you know like a lot of people are internet bullies yeah. Um, but you know, nobody really showed up and I was really grateful and, you know, this, we've done like nine, 10 tournaments since then. And, and, you know, it's not really been any sort of a situation. I mean, we, we are still get the messages. Yeah. We'll still get the hate. We'll still get, but the numbers have reduced. And I think we are seeing more of an acceptance mm -hmm. and more of like a normalcy of women's cricket in me. 
which I think is what's required. You know, Sana Mir really, you know, now has become like kind of the face of women's cricket and has been for some time. You know, there's a lot of other players. Nida Dar, when she made it to the Big Bash League, it was like a really big deal. You know, yeah. like all of a sudden, like, you know, because pe- a lot of people didn't even know that women's cricket team existed. You know what I mean? So now it's slowly, like the more this coming into mainstream media, the more you're like, I'm seeing more smaller journalists and people trying to come up in the ranks, following women's cricket, trying to tweet about it, trying to create awareness about it. So you are seeing a difference. And I see that because other countries are investing so much in women's cricket, you're mm-hmm. seeing that the overall ecosystem is changing, whereby mm-hmm. now it's becoming less of a novelty, less of a PR stunt, less of a CSR campaign for a corp company, and yeah. more of like, this is something worth looking into. This is something worth investing in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've long felt that, you know, in many aspects, both both countries, India and Pakistan, have uh, plenty of problems when it comes to administration of women's cricket. But in many aspects, Pakistan has done a lot of things right in terms of their women's cricket uh, ahead of uh, India. You know, earlier to introduce contracts, with recently with, we've seen with Bisma's case, earlier to introduce a parental care policy, which is, I mean, groundbreaking, honestly speaking. Uh, and how much of what so that's the impact that the international community sees that's the impact that we see can you tell me like stories of impact that you've seen where you've had you know girls coming into your tournaments and then what happens to them do uh, have you had stories of for example girls going on to play within the uh, the mainstream hardball cricket system or people just messaging you and saying um, okay now my family is okay to letting me play because of this tournament existed and stuff like that. I'd like to know about the impact that you've seen through uh, Kilo Cricket on the women's cricket community at the grassroots. So I think I'll start by saying the biggest thing is trying to create a safe environment for women to play cricket. And I think that a lot of the times the question would come into everybody's head is that, you know, is this a safe, wholesome, healthy environment? Will our daughters or our sisters or, you know, our friends be in danger by playing? You know, these these were sort of some of obviously, and I think that exists anywhere in the world, to be honest, just being a woman. If you are out in a field anywhere, there is that thought process that are you safe? Um, And I think, um, honestly, from I can only speak from my experience. And when, you know, every single women's cricket tournament, I have been there. Um, I have stood on the ground and I have been there, whether it's all night or have, because it gives the parents a sense of reassurance that there is um, a woman who is running this, who will make sure that our daughters are safe. And I've had parents come up to me and really be very, very thankful about the fact that, you know, they felt like they could leave their daughters, come back after a few hours, everything was going to be okay. Didn't matter that it was super late at night, you know, that we had created a little bit more of like, it was, you know, a little bit more of like a, like a, in like a community feeling, you know, where everybody was looking out for each other on the ground and everything was a little bit okay. And, you know, um, there, there, I think that has sort of helped a lot. Um, so we definitely did have like parents and siblings and a lot of people come up to us and not just me, like my entire team at Kalo and everything and be like, you know, like we really, it came from a place of like gratitude of knowing that their daughters would be okay. Mm. Um, but also um, when it comes to like, there's so many girls who've played in our tournaments and they've gone on to be a part of the Pakistan A team or the Pakistan women's team. And that may not necessarily be because of Kalo cricket at all, but it's yep. just that they, we've seen them play in our tape ball tournaments. We've seen them play in our hardball tournaments. And then it just so happened that the same girls who were performing really well in these ended up, you know, they were playing for an academy that took them further and they made it to the Pakistan team. And it's really exciting because we've actually seen their progress in a sense. So I'll give you an example. Fatma Sana, who won just the ICC Emerging Women's Cricketer of the Year Award. Tremendous challenge. Yeah, she's amazing. And she was, I think, 12 years old when she came Uh to uh, our first women's cricket tournament in 2016. Uh And she was, she won player of the tournament. And, um, you know, she was like, I remember watching her and being like, oh, my God, this girl is amazing. Like, she's absolutely incredible, you know, and she's really a star to watch out for. And I, as I've been following her career and, you know, we, I've had many interactions with her because she's played a lot of Kalo's smaller end tournaments while yeah. she was part of the PCB system as well. Yeah. And as I was watching her progress and then this year when she won the Emerging Women's Cricket, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Like, 
six years on, she like did it. Like she, she made it. She's, she's doing incredibly well. She is going to be somebody who everybody now knows. And she's somebody who sort of normalized, you know, women's cricket again, because now, now we all of a sudden her gender became irrelevant the minute that she won an accolade. Yeah. Because now you want an accolade, you know, and and it's it's almost like you know when they say that um, race doesn't matter when you're part of the one percent, right? So in a similar way, I feel like gender doesn't matter when you're a, because now she's part of this elite panel of women cricketers, and all of a sudden, the first one ever from Pakistan to have won an award like this, and it's like, oh my god, like. No, nobody once said, oh, Fatma Sana, you know, women's cricketer, or nobody judged anything about her. It was all of a sudden, everybody's like clapping their hands and posting wonderful Twitter accolades about her. And I'm like, this, this is what needs to happen. The yeah. more you do well, the more you see the international community backing your players, the more you're like, forget women, men, cricketer, hai na. that's mm. the thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more and I felt the same when uh, Pakistan won those uh, gold medals in the Asian Games that, you know, at, when you when you come home with a gold medal, they don't say it's a women's gold medal, it's a gold medal, it's adding to your country's yeah. tally and so the recognition that comes with that is just so much more universal than uh, something that would otherwise be isolated to a women's cricket tournament. Um, so, like I said, one of the uh, biggest reasons that I reached out to you is because I'm involved with similar initiatives that we're trying to build in India. Uh, I co-authored the first ever research paper on women's cricket in India um, last year, the Equal Hue Report. Um, and we put that out as a starting point to try and make impacts in the ecosystem where, you know, we identify first what the gaps are and then uh, try to work with partners from the private uh, industry, from the private world to, um, you know, use funds that they have, either CSR funds or through marketing initiatives to try and bridge these gaps. So what I what I would really like to ask you is what, what advice can you give me when it comes to uh, women's cricket tournaments and, you know, women's cricket initiatives uh, and dealing with, like, I have a lot more experience on the cricket side of things, but very little experience on the business side of things. So yeah. from yeah. your own perspective as well. Honestly, um, when it comes to advice, that's a hard one. Um, I would say that it needs to be a good mix of tape ball and hard ball as well. I think seeing the impact by placing girls in the ride academies, having the scouts, having people be there at the tournaments, you need relevant parties there. You need just doing a tournament isn't enough. You need somebody, whether it's from the BCCI, whether it's um, a coaches, whether it's an academy person, if these girls are coming out to play your tournaments, they need to see somewhat of a future in there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I also think it's very important to create an infrastructure that's not just about playing cricket, you know, um, and I think that's probably going to be step two for what you need to do. And by that, I mean, female umpires, that by that, I mean, female commentators, by that, I mean, um, you know, uh, female scorers and uh, coaches and, uh, you know, journalists. And if you create an environment where being a woman in a cricketing world mm -hmm. is very, very normal and is something and it keeps happening. And the more you do it, the more normal it becomes, the more girls come into the fold, the more it becomes just like uh, an everyday situation. I think that's the only way to see real progress. When you go from calling them a women cricketer to just calling them a cricketer, from calling them a female umpire to just saying they're umpires, right? I think that's, that's kind of every time we put the word female in front of something, it kind of, then you're differentiating it. Have you ever heard anybody say Aleem Dar is a male umpire? Mm, Nobody yeah. does that. Somebody is an umpire, somebody is a journalist, somebody is a commentator, you know. Um, so you kind of, I feel like that's that's kind of important. From a business perspective, I would say to you um, that getting funds and making people see the value of women's cricket is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, and I still struggle with that every single time. Every single tournament that comes up, I am running for sponsorships. I am literally standing in front of corporations and different individuals and trying to explain to them how important it is to keep the game going. Mm -hmm. And that was my biggest fear of 2020 was that the game for women's cricket was going to stop. And it did stop because you mm -hmm. saw that the men's game somehow continued even on international level. But yeah. all of a sudden, the women's tournament switched from 2020 to 2023. 
Mm. In 2022, but the men's tournaments were only going ahead six months and eight months. I mean, IPL is also happening, and PSL is also happening, and Big Bash is also happening. But the women's game is not happening. Yeah, you know. And I was like, and the ironic part is that women were surviving COVID more than men were. So I'm like, how is this making any sense? You know, how is this making any sense? But it's very easy because you don't because from a commercial aspect, you know, you. hitting pause on a women's tournament is far yeah. easier than hitting pause on a men's tournament and i think in order to grow that viewership in order to kind of get that going they you need to invest similarly in women's games and i think that's been the hardest thing especially for us i mean even today i i know that we have ramzan tournaments coming up in april and we have so much stuff that we have lined up and i know that i'm back to the drawing board i'm back to speaking to people for money i'm back to trying to raise funds for it but it's something that needs to keep happening and you know it's really going to happen when it becomes less about csr and pr and mm. becomes more about companies genuinely wanting to back the sport yeah. you know and i don't know whether it's like this in india but in pakistan definitely there are so many random amateur community leagues for men's cricket that get insane sponsorship and then you go in front of the same people for women's cricket and all of a sudden you know their budgets are slashed by tenfold and you're like but i don't understand you the the what they don't even have a future at least there's something here you know so keep the sport going don't let it stop keep your tournaments going no matter you have to keep play on you mm. have to keep on and that's the only way to get impact going yeah very much uh, in the uh, line of kind of the experiences we are having here talking to a lot of people they are like okay great idea great idea put your money where your mouth is if you really think it's a great idea um, yeah. and that's one of the challenges we are facing and um, at the same time it's a huge opportunity because it's uh, with like you said with women's cricket you, you can very well demonstrate a future for these players the fact is that there are since there are less girls playing there is a higher chance of you know one of your participants like fatima sana go ahead to play and uh, be a part of the national team and that pathway is very much there so so that's that's a challenge that we're constantly working on and this is uh, this is definitely helpful i'm going to keep an eye on how uh, khelo keeps uh, coming back from this um, i want to uh, wrap up with one question with which essentially kind of will touch on a lot of things as to can you give me a, like an idea of the day in the life of the the way because there are so many things going on especially you know at a busy time where you're managing everything give me an idea of like what your day looks like and how you have a mental space to manage it um so i don't always have the mental space to manage it but um a day in the life is sort of honestly i just uh, get up i come straight to the office and uh, at my office where i'm currently sitting it is uh, my textile office so i kind of do all my work from here um in in essence even like kilo meetings and things i'll just have people come in and sit here it's just easier than like running across town and doing something um so i like spend my morning doing all of like my tablers like which is my textile company like i'll just spend my morning doing all of that and then like come 3 o'clock i switch to kind of kilo mode and then it's like looking at all of kilo's things catching up on everything making sure everything is you know up to mark the photographers are where they are everybody's there you know what tournaments are happening what fundraising is going on so like i kind of do that then in the second half um i would say um some days it's a lot more work than other days i think in ramzan my textile company takes a step back for sure because there's that much cricket that's being played i think in early winter from november to february it's a very heavy hardball season of cricket because the weather is so beautiful that everybody wants to play um so you know again then like my textile company kind of takes a back seat in the sense that you know i'll end up attributing more hours to kelo in that sense and you know be trying to just finish off the emails do the bare minimum and then switch over to kelo and then making sure that everything is you know as per what it's supposed to be are we doing a tournament are we you know what are we doing how are we doing it um so just sort of through that um it does get manic i'm not going to lie that there are days when i'm like this is a little mad something's got to give um but uh, it's fun man i i don't i can't imagine a life without kelo i think it's opened so many doors for me in so many other ways that i don't think you know would have ever happened for me um you know i'm now part of the sin cricket association board as well which was like really really exciting for me um you know being as young as i am and being as excited and feeling like i could actually do something at a higher level which would actually genuinely 
create that infrastructure for women's cricket and better the sport, which is something that I've been wanting to do, but Kalo is limited in certain ways. And, you know, the Sim Cricket Association, and just like with the help of a lot of the support system I had, you know, it's kind of cool that we can work with people and, and actually create a plan because nothing exists at the moment. You know, everything is kind of ad hoc. So yeah. if you can be a part of something that creates a foundation, why not? That's, I mean, that, and that's great news. And um, it's probably rare for me to hear and, you know, my experience of cricket administration in India to see someone who's not a former cricketer brought into cricket administration. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if that's a big deal in uh, in the Sindh Association, but for me to hear that, and that's probably a, a recognition of you know the kind of impact that you have made in the community over there. Honestly, I was very like surprised when when I got the call. I was quite excited as well. Um, but I think it just came from having a passion for the sport, having a passion for women's cricket. And and genuinely, I I know a little bit now, having done it for so many years, what the infrastructure is, what the players are, what the academies are, and stuff. So for me, it wasn't like starting from scratch. Um, mm. And so I think that's something that definitely helped. And. I mean, I hope, you know, I mean, I listen, I have, I'm very like starry eyed still, like I have a lot of hopes and dreams for what we can do. Now, if we get there, we get there. But, you know, I mean, you can't predict anything in this world, but I think that we're making the steps in the right direction. And I also think that like watching Australia and watching England and seeing their academies and trying to see how well they're doing with women's cricket, you kind of feel that like, why are we not there? How are we not there? I mean, even yeah. India has done significantly better than Pakistan on an international scale, you know? Um, so for, for us to, I mean, I remember I was like watching uh, like the Indian women's game and thinking to myself, like, wow, you, you know, your players are actually a lot more advanced in a lot of ways. And, you know, you guys probably don't think that way, but but for, for from our perspective, you know, we're like, wow, there's so much promise there. There's so much more, um, you know, it's so much more organized than it is over yeah. here. And it seems like, you know, uh, there's a lot more academies, there's a lot more girls playing. Um, you know, I'm hearing rumors of a women's IPL or something, you know, so, so I don't know. I mean, if that happens, that would be huge, you know, um, but just see, just hearing and seeing all of this, it's, it's quite exciting. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Um, I'll sneak in one more last question in terms of, you know, what does the future of Kalo look like? What do you think? Where do you think uh, this initiative is going I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Um, I, uh, I'm i hoping that at some point we are able to be a feeder program uh, to the PCB, um, mm. especially when it comes to women's cricket. Um, mm. I would love for us to be able to see the players that we have on a grassroots level, on our table, in our hardball tournaments, choose the best performance and then give those stats and almost become like a hosting platform and a feeder program to the PCB and say, here are all the hundred girls that have done really well over the last two seasons, you know, and then having them see their fitness levels, having them see how good or bad or different they are. And then perhaps allowing that to create a new crop of women cricketers in Pakistan, whether it's an under 19 level or a developing emerging level and see their progress throughout. And I think that's kind of where I'm hoping Kalo will be. Nice. I mean, that's so um, so aligned with some of the dreams we have for the Equal You project as well. Uh, and I like wish you all the best with not just the women's cricket side of things, but all with uh, all the men's cricket side of things as well, um, and the textile stuff. I mean, I appreciate that, that, it. That, that is that is a conversation we need to have another interview yes. for because um, I, I'm sure there must be some stories over there. <laughs>